Hi, uh, welcome back. So, uh, at this point of time, right, in the development of LLMs, it was clear that scale is leading to better performance, data set sizes are also having an influence on the performance, and LLMs are sort of here to stay, right? I mean, it's worth training these bigger and bigger models, right? So, thus, this time came a very systematic study, right, one of the, among the first of many, right, that, uh, which, <coughs> So at this time came uh, one such study uh, which tried to answer these questions of what really matters for the performance, right? what are the choices that could affect the performance and can we systematically study these choices and then come up at the right model design that we want to uh, use. right? So, And this was the T5 uh, paper which was text-to-text uh, -text transfer transformers, right? so text-to-text -text transfer transformers, hence T5. Uh, so, what we are going to do is like we are going to sort of uh, go over that entire study and then finally arrive at the T5 architecture. A lot of this is based on the uh, presentation from the original authors of the paper. Right? So, let us start. So, the first thing that we do is uh, to set the context. right? So, let us compare the performance of GPT which is a 110 million parameter model and BERT. Right? So, one is a decoder only model and one is an encoder only model and we are going to compare their performance. And looks like the large model of BERT across multiple data sets. So, every column here is one such NLP task. It could be about natural language inference or it could be about uh, uh, some uh, paraphrasing or, or some such tasks, right? Entailment and other tasks. <coughs> so, every column here is one NLP task, right? It could be a paraphrasing task, it could be a natural language inference task or a question answering task. And we are just tracking the performance on the benchmark for that task, right? Uh, and this is, of course, using a full fine tuning. Right? This is not like an, a zero shot evaluation, but the fine tuned model which is evaluated. And here, we, if we naively look at this table, then we see that the BERT large model is actually doing better than the GPT model, right? So now, what is responsible for this performance? Why is one model performing better than the other? in all or some tasks. Right? In this case, it is doing better in all the tasks, but why is it the case? Right? Is it because of the size of the data set? One model was trained only on the books corpus, which was 0.7 billion tokens versus the other top, other, corpus, other model which was trained on books corpus as well as Wikipedia. So, it was 3.5 billion tokens. Right? So, maybe five times more data was used for training. So, is that the reason why that model performs better? Or is it because of the pre-training objective, right? One used uh, causal language modeling and the other used masked language modeling and there are several other choices which could have been uh, used, right? So, is it because of that that the performance is better or is it because of the size of the model, right? So, GPT is 117 million versus BERT largest three times almost that model, right? So, is it because of that, that it has more capacity, hence it is able to learn better from the training data, more capacity, more training data and hence it is doing better, right? Or is it because training a model for longer? One was trained for time t steps, other was trained for 4 t steps, right? And which is directly a function of the amount of compute used, right? So you imagine you train the model for on some uh, 100 nodes for one day versus you train the model on some 100 nodes for four days, right? So you are clearly doing more training in the uh, latter case, and does that lead to better performance? Or is it because of the way one fine tunes the model, right? So in the case of uh, GPT, you add a linear layer and you learn that linear layer from scratch at the output. Well, in the case of BERT, you already, already have this uh, CLS, so you just fine tune that uh, set of weights, right? Because you already had the spatial CLS token, right? So, there are many such choices, right? And I've listed a few of them, right? And to answer these questions, we need to conduct an extensive experimentation by keeping the parameters constant, right? And studying all these models under similar conditions, right? You cannot say that one model was trained on 10 times the more data and then say, okay, this is the best model, right? Because it might just be that the data is more, you could have used the same data for training the other model and it would have given you better performance, right? So, there are these pre-training data sets, whether it's Wikipedia, books, web crawl, of course, today it's much, much larger than these data sets that are listed here. Then you could have the encoder model, uh, you could have the scale of the model. Is it a small model, a medium model, a large model, a very large model, right? So, there are all these, also these Excel models, right? So, small, medium, large, Excel. And this is just the, the, the way you get these variants is just by changing the number of layers as well as playing around with the D model size and the size of the feed forward uh, network, right? Uh, the compression, the middle layer that you have there. 
And similarly, you could have the encoder decoder model. Again, you could have the same questions there. And what is being trying, to, what we are trying to say here is that you cannot compare a large encoder based model with a small encoder decoder model and then claim, oh, this model performs better. So, encoder only models are actually better, right? So, that's the point being made. There are many choices you are making and you have to make sure that all these choices are comparable, right? You cannot compare a small with a large or a model trained on only like one tenth of the total data that the other model was trained on. Similarly, you could have a decoder model where again you could have these choices, right? Then when, when you're doing pre-training, there are several hyperparameters. You could have the number of training steps, the learning rate scheme that you use, the optimizer that you used, and also the objective that you used. In the case of encoder only model that we saw, that was the mass language modeling objective. But here again, you have choices like what was the corruption rate that you used? That means how many tokens were corrupted? Was it only 15%, 1%, 25%, 50%, as you can imagine, all that also matters, right? And what, what, what did you did token deletion? Did you use span masking? And then what did you use for fine tuning, right? Again, there are, did you fine tune on each of these data sets? Again, if when you are fine tuning, what were your choices that you used there, right? <coughs> Same thing for if you are pre-training a deco encoder decoder model, then again you have similar hyperparameters, you have similar choices for the loss function, the objective function that you can use. And within the loss function also you have choices about, so example just as there you had the masked language model, then you have the choice of how much, what is the percentage of corruption that you do. Similarly in the denoising objective, you could have choices like what is the length of the spans that you are corrupting and how many, what percentage of spans you are corrupting and so on. And then you could fine tune that and same thing applies here also, right? In the case of decoder only models, we have the uh, causal language model and today we are also going to see the prefix language model uh, objective and the same thing, right? So just think there are too many things which are varying here and you cannot sort of have these things hidden and then say, okay, this model performs better than that. You need to make a systematic choice where you keep as many of these things constant across the different things that you are comparing and then arrive at uh, logical conclusions about which model is better or which of these choices collectively are better, right? So what uh, the study, right, I mean, try, was trying to do is that can we have the same objective for both pre-training and fine-tuning stages? That is one of the questions to be answered and that's the reason why we were building this idea of prompt and I'll just spend some time here. <clears throat> so. Currently, at least when we are looking at it in the context of uh, say BERT, right? So your pre-training objective is the masked language modeling objective, right? Where you have corrected some inputs, you have masked some inputs and you are trying to predict it. But if you look at the fine-tuning objective, if you are trying to fine-tune this model for sentiment analysis, then you had this special CLS token and then you are trying to predict 1 or 0 from here, right? And this was the cross entropy loss function. Then, right? It was not the masked language modeling function, but the cross entropy loss function. Right? So the uh, the objective function used during pre-training and fine tuning was different. Similarly, when we had the GPT model, we had looked at the uh, objective function was the causal language modeling objective function. But again, when you are fine tuning the model for a specific task, you are again using like the cross entropy loss function and not the same as the causal language model. Right? So now, can I have a situation? where even for fine tuning for the specific task, can I use the same objective function? And that's where this idea of prompt that I've given you a prompt, summarize this, right? This is my task and then I have the input and then I just need to keep predicting the next token. That's all, right? So I'm just doing the same thing that I was doing at the time of pre-training, which was just trying to predict the next token. So can we have the same objective both for pre-training and fine-tuning. So now if you want to do sentiment analysis, then you just say, tell me whether this sentence is positive or negative or uh, yeah, you could just have that as the task specific prompt. Then you give the sentence and the model just generates the word negative, positive, neutral, right? So it's no longer doing classification. It's just generating the next token. So now again, uh, just as you are using the causal language modeling at the time of uh, pre-training, the same objective you can use at the time of uh, fine-tuning because you have converted the task to a text generation task. So all tasks you could sort of convert to them, right? And we'll come back to this point, but that's what this question means, right? I have not fully answered it yet, 
but just build some intuition on what we are trying to say with this question, right? I don't want two separate training objectives. Yeah, so that's what, can we have the architecture that uses sort of a combination of CLM and MLM? And can we use a pre-training data which is as large as possible, right? So these are some of the questions that they had, many more actually, and we'll see all of that. And so let's do a systematic study around all these different choices that we have. And that was the sort of uh, study done in the original T5 paper. And you compare a different set of approaches on a diverse set of tasks while keeping many factors fixed, right? Or at least not varying too many things at the same time. You could compare, you could keep everything constant and just change the scale of the model. You go from 100 million parameters to 200 to 400 to 800, right? And now in this, if the 800 model really does uh, the same, keeping all the other uh, sort of choices fixed, they were all the same for the small, medium, large and Excel model. And now if the 4x or the 8x model does really well, then you know that it's mainly because of the scale. It's because you have increased the scale of the model. That's why you're seeing a better performance. And it's not because suddenly you started using a different training data or suddenly you changed the objective function. Everything was kept constant. And only this thing was, only this particular choice was uh, given more options. Okay. So the basic idea in this paper, and that's what I was trying to say when I was talking about, can we have the same objective function, was to treat this as text in, text out, right? So there is no classes. You're not doing like a classification problem. If you want to do sentiment analysis, one way of looking at it is you're given an input and you're trying to do a classification of positive, negative. The other is to look at it as a text in and text out task, wherein you're giving an input and you're expecting a text at the output. The text just happens to be a label, which is positive, negative, neutral, right? So the model could just generate the output instead of doing like a classification of labels, right? Because the labels could be 0, 1, it could be true, false, it could be negative, positive, anything. But here you're saying that just generate the next word, which could be negative. So it's like a question, what do you think is the sentiment of this sentence? followed by the sentence and then the model predicts the next token which could be negative, positive, neutral, right? And this they did for all the tasks. Now translate English to Tamil, I enjoyed the movie. Now this has been given as an input to the model and the task of the model is to keep generating the next tokens which is whatever is the translation of this sentence into uh, Tamil, right? Uh, or yeah, it has generated the translation or you could say summarize and then give it a passage and now the task of the model is to generate the next set of tokens, which are actually a summary of the original input that was given. Same way you could have a, a sentence and you could just, uh, I don't know what this task is. Ah, this sentence one, the rhino uh, grazed on the grass and a rhino is grazing in a field. Are these two sentences similar? And it could just generate a score, right? So you're not no longer doing regression. You're just trying to generate uh, like a, score as the next token, right? So everything just becomes about generation and sort of maps to how humans deal with this task, right? So we don't really think of, if you ask me, what is this review saying? You'll not think of it as, oh, it is saying class one or class two. You'll just say positive or negative, right? You'll just say, uh, you'll just uh, generate the answer as opposed to sort of thinking of it as a classification problem, right? And you just have a task specific prefix appended. So now in this setup, everything looks like even in the pre-training, I'm given a sequence and I have to predict certain tokens. Maybe I'm predicting the corrupted tokens or maybe I'm predicting the next set of tokens. So corrupted tokens as in the case of a bird style objective or next set of tokens as in the case of a GPT style or a causal language modeling, right? And it looks like even for the tasks, I'm doing the same thing. I've been given a sequence. That sequence also have a, has a prefix which tells me what to do and I just keep generating the next set, right? So there's no difference between what I do at pre-training time and what I do at fine-tuning time. So that's the idea that I was trying to explain when I was talking about the wish list and the questions that we had. So they said everything is text in, text out. There is no classification, regression, or any of these types, right? Then for the data set, uh, they went much higher in scale than what the previous studies were doing. They came up with something known as the colossal clean crawled corpus, right? So they started with uh, this common crawl and did a lot of cleaning of that data because one of the contributions or one of the observations of this paper was that data cleanliness matters a lot. If you put in a lot of noisy data, your model will learn all sorts of noisy things and the performance on downstream tasks, downstream tasks would be poor, right? And this was mainly English data collected from the web 
and it had 156 billion tokens and right? it is a large amount of data, 750 GB. They use the sentence piece tokenizer. So again, as I had said, all the tokenizers can go with any of the models that we study. So here they use the sentence piece. The vocab size was 32,000. That means the sub number of subword units that they had in the vocabulary was 30, 32,000. The number of tokens I already said, and this was like 52 times bigger than what BERT was trained on, right? So really scale started showing up at this point where you're really scaling up the data sets. And as we'll see towards the end of the uh, paper, also scaling up the size of the uh, model, right? And how do you go about curating such large data sets? As I said, we have a separate lecture on that. Yeah, so this is uh, the context of the study, right? So have a very large data set, consider all different factors which can be sort of affect the performance, study them systematically, and then make a choice which contains the best choice for every factor in terms of what should the size of the model be, what should the objective function be. That's the study that we are going to see. So the next few videos would be about looking at their experiments, drawing conclusions from there, and sort of making up our mind on what is the right choice and towards the end sort of build a model with sort of come to the uh, model which has all those right choices in it, right? So that's what we are going to do. So I'll end this video here and we'll come back and start looking at the results of the different experiments that they